We have a guest in the studio and he's a paleontologist. Dr. Frederick Mundy is with us. He is from the National Museums of Kenya. He's a senior research scientist and head of the paleontology section. He's with us in the studio. Good morning, Dr. Tari. Good morning. Nice to be with you here today. Welcome to the Situation Room. This is Kenya's biggest conversation. Of course, you know that. And we call that the hot seat. What we do with the hot seat is we're warming up for our guests so that we can have some nice conversation. Uh, so we are going back into our past. So, of course, we need to warm it up sufficiently. When you hear this proverb, now that you deal with things from <laughs> days gone days by. Days of yore. Uh, the, Not does this, historic. Uh, prehistoric. 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 <laughs> does this make sense? It does. This, this particular proverb. It does make sense, uh, but again, it, it depends on how you look at it. Yeah. But I, I would like to first of all correct by saying that I'm, I'm not head of paleontology. Yeah. I'm the director of antiquities, sites and monuments at the National Museums of Kenya. Director uh, of antiquities, sites, sites and, and monuments. monuments at the National Museums of Kenya. Mm. And um, I'm also a paleontologist, like you said, senior paleontologist. Mm. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that people always ask what, what paleontology is. And I think it's always good to kind of just introduce the topic, even as we go forward. Paleontology is study of fossils, mm -hmm. and and fossils are ancient remains of early forms of life, animals that lived many years ago, plants that lived many years ago, and here we are talking about millions of years ago, not just the more historical time periods. Mm. I know the proverb that that our, our, my brother here spoke about to me is very historical. But I'm here to talk about prehistorical <laughs> uh, so problems. So, what is like. prehistoric? Pre prehistory is a study of uh, life and, and and all events that happened before the invention of writing. Documentation. Documentation. Mm. Thank you. Documentation. So, it's writing. before recorded history. Before recorded history. So, that's prehistory. Okay. And we are able to access that through, through paleontology, through archaeology, and through uh, remains that we find in lots of our sites across across Kenya mm. and world over. So that's prehistory. And, and indeed, prehistory is very critical to us mm. now and in the future because for us to understand the dynamics that we see in our times, the different environments, the, dif the different events that we see in our times and that we'll see them in the future, we need to understand the past because understanding the past enables us to to kind of really appreciate what we are, what we are going through, what we are seeing in our times, and and, and also in fact, uh, and also it also enables us also protect the fauna and the flora that we have in our times. I, I, I'll tell you this morning that they we've lost a lot of fauna species in this country, mm. and not just Kenya, but world over. Dinosaurs roamed this part of the world over 100 million, million years ago. They got they got extinct. Lots of other fauna species, they got extinct. So by, by, by learning about the prehistoric times, we are able to appreciate the fact that extinction still lives with us. Mm. And if we don't protect our fauna and flora, they'll become extinct. We also become extinct. We, we don't take care of, an, of the environment and, and take care of ourselves. So indeed, understanding the past enables us face the challenges that we have in our times. Is extinction not a natural cycle? It's a natural cycle. Uh, but 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 determined by different factors, uh, different different events. Uh, it could be environmental events like the dinosaur. There are all kinds of kind of hypotheses as to how it became extinct. But we know, aside from the dinosaurs, we know there are lots of other fauna taxa that have become extinct over the years. And 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 we know that they became extinct thanks to factors. It could be environmental. Mm. It could be even anthropogenic factors um, influenced or induced by, by man ourselves. We are one species that, that is really, really destroying the environment and raping the environment uh, west, south, northeast. Mm. And, and we know that uh, if we don't really change the way we do things, uh, a lot of taxa, a lot of species are going to become extinct. Mm. I, I th remember you, you know very well in the 90s uh, when, when the elephant or when the rhino in Kenya was almost going extinct, uh, we know that was as a result of poaching, which are anthropogenic. And and if the government of Kenya didn't do anything at that time, mm. most likely elephants would have become extinct locally. So we know we know that we know all of us have a, a role to play in ensuring that we protect our fauna, 
flora and also the environment because because we are we are one species mm. in a large ecosystem in which we have so many other taxa that live alongside us doc you're here because we want to talk about uh, kariandusi the prehistoric site this friday the 25th of february the national museums of kenya and others will be celebrating kariandusi day now there are very many people who have heard kariandusi they don't know exactly what it is where it is or uh, the importance of kariandusi so just introduce us to kariandusi as best you can thank you uh first of all i would like to say that uh before going to kariandusi i think i need to really underscore kenya as the cradle of humanity uh kariandusi is one of the many sites that this country has that 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 have yielded a rich record of our ancestry as a species the ancestry of so many other fauna species the ancestry of so many uh, flora species and again also the way we've evolved technologically uh uh, the Trukana Basin uh, is extremely rich in our prehistoric, in prehistoric records. We have wonderful fossil remains, wonderful archaeological remains that have come from that part of the basin. The Baringo Basin, again also in the central rift, is also, it's also extremely rich uh, in faunal remains, fossil remains of, of early forms of life. Ologesele, not far away from here, from Nairobi, which is in Kajado County, it's also extremely rich uh, in, in archaeological remains and, 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 and fossil remains that document the ancestry of so many different species, including our own members of our own genus, Homo. Uh, so Kariandusi is one among the very many tens and tens of uh, sites across the country that have yielded a wonderful, wonderful record mm. that really tells us about our ancestry as a species. Mm. Human beings, we are an end product of a long journey that we've walked uh, from the very early times, like in the last seven million years ago into the present. So you and I, we are an end product. We mm -hmm. are at the tail end of a long journey that, that our, our human species, I mean human, human uh, lineage, mm -hmm. have gone over time. Going uh, back to Kariandusi, mm -hmm. Kariandusi uh, is in the Central Rift, not far away, around the Gilgil area, along Nar Nairobi Nakuru Road, very close to uh, Lake El Medeta. It's a site that was worked uh, from the early, uh, maybe 1940s or thereabout, mm -hmm. uh, by, by Louis Leakey. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a site that has yielded some wonderful remains of, of, of archaeological tools uh, uh, known as Achillean. These are largely hand axes. The hand axes were meant and used by Homo erectus, uh, uh, and 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 we know that uh, uh, these were meant and used by Homo erectus because of because it, they belong to the Achillean industry. Mm. The Achillean industry began from around 1.6 million years ago, and it's been largely associated with with Homo erectus. So, Kariandusi is extremely rich in that that part of our history as a species mm. it's a site that really really all of us as kenyans and the world over i think we should be all very proud of the site it's accessible to many of us because it's on along the, the Nairobi nakuru highway and and this friday we're going to have an event that is going to celebrate that that aims at celebrating that particular site it's key to us as Kenyans because it documents our, our, our rich, it's part of our rich heritage. Mm. As I said earlier on, we, Kenya is extremely rich in peaceful heritage. So Kariandusi really is one of, one of the sites that really document very well that rich history. The site uh, dates to around between one million years ago, although it was um, about maybe, uh, maybe over a million years ago, and it documents that rich history of our ancestry as a species. What are some of the things that this particular site then would show? I mean, here you're talking about documentation of the rich history. What are some of the things that has been able to, that you've been able to, that have been found over time that would give or lend information as to what happened in this area prehistorically? That's a good question. Uh, like I just said, there are wonderful archeological tools uh, the Chilean industry, the hand access, and 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 those indeed, indeed, and and they occur in in situ. You can see they occur in the, the exact spot where they were first deposited 
by our early human ancestors. They've not been washed away. Mm. So we know, we know that that is their primary uh, point or site of deposition. Mm -hmm. So the tools are there. You can see them for yourself. And they occur within some very uh, defined and def defined geological strata mm. and beds. And, and that enables uh, really a very accurate dating of the tools. We, we know that the, the tools date to this time period because they occur within a very refined and defined uh, unit in the stratigraphy. Mm -hmm. And they occur in situ, and we know they've not been washed away. They've, they've not, they've not, they haven't come from far away. We know they occur in situ. And, and again, also, there are some very nice uh, volcanic tuffs, oh. ashes. Uh, in, in Kenya and in East Africa in, in, in particular, we are very fortunate because we have uh, volcanic ashes that occur within our, within our fossil sites and archaeological sites. And the volcanic ashes, we call them tuffs, mm -hmm. that's the scientific name, and we are able to date the tuffs and determine the age of those sites based on when the, that particular tuff was deposited. So Kalindusi has the, the tools, the mm -hmm. hand axes uh, in situ, which is really, really a, a very, very important thing. Mm -hmm. And again, also, they occur within strata that are easily datable. So it makes all this make, make the site very unique, mm -hmm. very unique because the tools are there, you can see them, and they occur in situ, and they occur within... Within, um, uh, within a defined place. Exactly, defined place. What does that tell us? Was this a village? Was this and a town? And were people primarily hunting for food kind of thing, is what I'm saying. The people who lived in that area, would you then be able to take the next logical conclusion, which meant that people here primarily hunted for food as opposed to farmed for food kind of thing? No question about that. We mm. know, we know, we know that these tools were made by Homo erectus. Mm. We know, pretty sure. We are pretty sure mm -hmm. that they were made by Homo erectus, and then we know that Homo erectus were not, were not, they not began to do farming. Mm. They were more of hunters and gatherers. Mm. Mm -hmm. So they would go hunt there, they, and, and out there, and and they would after they they made their queue, they would use the stone tools to to. Uh, cut the meat or slaughter the goat. I mean, not the goat, but they, they're killed. Mm. They're killed. Mm. So we know that they went how they're hunting. And they used the stone tools to skin or even cut their, their kill. Mm. And this has been documented not, not just at Kalindusi, but also in other, in other sites across across the country and even beyond Kenya. Mm. Yeah, so we know that the Omo rectors were not farmers. Mm. We know farming began much more recent, mm -hmm. and 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 we know that Homo erectus, or were also in fact the first species, human species, to move out of Africa and occupy other parts of the world. We know they were hunters and gatherers, and and we, we we believe they could also have scavenged. I mean, like when they found a cute a lion that killed some uh. some animal, we believe that they may also have, 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 have scavenged. But there's a lot of evidence to suggest that Homo erectus were hunters well, and gatherers. Uh, there's. Also, uh, reading the history of Kariandusi or the history around Kariandusi indicates that there were lakes or there was a huge lake around there. So what does that tell us? If there was a water body and then we are finding these hand axes there and these were hunters and gatherers, did they also know fishing? Why were they close to this water body? Was it also because the animals would then come close to the water bodies? What I'm trying to establish is why are we finding particular uh, tools in this particular region, like you keep saying, in situ, that's this is where exactly they were. Happened. They, hap that's they, they a, happened. That's a wonderful observation. I think. I think from now going forward, I'll pronounce you as a paleontologist. Ah, uh, please. <laughs> because because Ooh. you've just said it. Mm. You've just said it. Uh, animals, even 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 today, uh, all animal species, they they, they 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 tend to congregate near water bodies. Look at even even our cities across the world. Mm. Where there's a water body, you you are likely to see cities building mm. along. Look at how many cities we have along the Mississippi River in mm. the U.S. So many cities. Mm. Look at the cities that we have around, like Victoria, Kisumu, uh, Jinja. If, if, if I mean, if if, if my history uh, That's me correct, correct. Mm. Mwanza. 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 So many of them. Why is why is that the case? Oma Bay, small. I mean. Why is that the case? Because water bodies provide a lot of a lot of goodies, if mm. I may use that particular word. 
new water bodies, there's be there'll be water for, for us to drink, there'll be water for animals, there'll be water for farming. So 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 the lake the water bodies around uh, uh around Gilgil area. Remember that those days there were there was no Gilgil. There was no Nakuru. <laughs> there was no Naivasha. There was no Naivasha. There was no Kenya, if you like. Uh. Yeah. I mean, there was, and these guys, they didn't have boundaries. There were no, there were no counties that, that you need to, I mean, Nyandarua County or Nakuru County. These guys had access to all the land uh, that, that, uh, that was there. There were no boundaries. Mm -hmm. In fact, even, I mean, I, I, like, I like making the cracking this joke, like, that Omo Rectors, when they moved from Africa to, to Europe and Asia, they didn't require passports or, or visas. Like we do, we're well, just taking a times. stroll, exactly taking a stroll, a long stroll, though. <laughs> a, long a long one, one. A long they one. got lost, they just didn't know how to come. <laughs> they, they may have gotten lost, it's, it's, it's very possible, <laughs> yeah. So, 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 uh, so it's not just uh, Kanenusi alone. So, we believe that uh, all rectors would have exploited the water bodies around, around, around that area then, mm. the same way they exploited the Lake Chukana. The, we know Lake Chukana has been there for a very long time. We know that the, the, the Lake Chukana, uh, the size of the lake, sometimes was even much bigger than it is right now. Mm. We know that the, the lake was there around 4 million years ago. We know the lake was there around 3.4. We know the lake was there about 1.7 or thereabout. So the, the, the lake, lake Chukana has been there over a very long time. Sometimes the water body, the the, the side of the lake was smaller. Mm. Other times it was, it was much bigger, and that's why we see a lot of fossil remains in the Lake Chukana Basin because those different animals exploited that water body, including members of our own, member I mean, of our ancestors, the Homo erectus, the Homo habilis. So we believe that the water bodies around uh, our Kariandusi area. Mm modern day area, those water bodies would have provided a, a conducive place for, for Homo erectus to thrive. Uh, an, an area where, where there are lots of other animals. So those animals, the, the, the antelopes, were food to the Homo erectus. They would have gone hunting mm. because, I mean, you see, you see in, even in our times, you see lions going, going close to water bodies to, to do hunt because they know gazelles and other animals who go down to the water bodies to drink water. So, so the water bodies around, or body around Kanedosi would have provide a very ideal place mm. for the Homo erectus to thrive. Something I'd like to ask, Dr. Tari, when we talk about uh, the science that determines the age and these processes that then form the larger discussion around archaeology or paleontology, how accurate is the science? Um, I would say it's accurate. You know, you know, you know, you know. Science is testable. It is. Uh, science you, you can take uh, a scientific hypothesis or explanation to science. I mean, to the lab and test. Yes. Unlike, unlike, unlike faith. Mm. If I, if you tell me, my, my brother, that you you are, you are, allow me to just say, a traditional believer. There's no way I can determine how, how what percentage. You are actually you can. I I am a social scientist, so I can tell you it's measurable. Yeah. You are, but can you, you say know, that ninety percent, eighty percent, fifty percent? Yes, you can. You the, can. The, you see the interesting. Okay, I would like to hear about that. You see the thing about science or natural sciences, which makes it perhaps more pleasurable, is because it's measurable. Yes, it's quantifiable. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we. I mean, to get back to your question. Yes. Uh, Scientists have been able to develop some very interesting uh, techniques yes. that that have grown over the, over the years. Yes, um, uh, and key among them is the potassium argon dating that that we we have been able to date most so of. So you our, moved away from carbon dating. Carbon dating can only date up to around fifty thousand years ago. Yes. Yeah, because because when an animal dies, uh, the carbon absorption into into the into the bone ceases because you are dead. Mm. Because that animal is not eating anymore. Mm -hmm. When you, when you, uh, you and I and all of us in this in this room, when we are eating, we are eating meat. There's carbon in the meat yeah. because the animal, the goat that we ate, ate leaves out there, ate plant matter out there. Mm. So all the time we are eating, our bones absorb carbon because we eat the meat, we eat smawiki, we eat, we eat all kinds of grains. Mm. So we, we, our bones absorb that carbon all the time. But when when we die, when an animal dies. That, is, that stops because we're dead. We're not eating anymore. Mm -hmm. So the, the carbon in our bones begin to decay, to, to decay, to decay. Then there's what we call half-life and all that. Yes, yeah, so, so 
carbon dating can only date up to around 50,000 years ago because by after that, there is hardly any carbon in our bones to date. And that's why we, we use now the more, more advanced techniques, uh, potassium agonidin, and that goes far back in time, and that's what we use to date most of our fossil sites. Yes, yeah, so techniques that we developed. Uh, don't ask me how because I'm. I, uh, that, that's a different area. No, I will not. I will yeah, not ask the yeah, question. That, 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 that's the is the preserve of the geologist. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and we work together as, as teams. We, we we work together with geologists, people who help data our sites. So that these techniques have been really refined pretty well, and we know that uh, that for example, these sites date to this time period because because we are able to date the volcanic ashes. Those are ashes that, that are found alongside the bones, the fossils, and even the archaeological materials. Dr. Frederick Manthi, he is a senior paleontologist, director of antiquities, sites, and monuments at the National Museums of Kenya. We are talking about Kariandusi, ahead of Kariandusi Day this Friday, the 25th of February. City, you're talking about faith and science. Well, why I mention faith and science eh. is this. Huh? There are those who argue that really there is no contradiction between the two. And they will even provide evidence from their religious books. There are those who say that when you talk about archaeology and you talk about uh, the, well, when, the, when your subject matter is evolution, there are those who argue that you are in fact contradicting the very essence of uh, many people's faith, which is creation. Now, I want not to talk about the differences, but I'd, I'd like Dr. Kaman to talk to us about where they meet, because you're Kenyan, you're a scientist, somewhere along the line your life must have collided with some faith or the other. Mm. And then you go into science, your chosen field of endeavor. You will come to a point where it isn't a crossroads. No, it's just a meeting point. And that's what I'd like him to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that um, I'm a Christian myself mm -hmm. and I don't have any problem or any issue with uh, the, the concept of evolution and, and science uh, and creation. Um, I think I believe very strongly that uh, these two can live, if you like, in harmony. Mm. And, and I'll begin by saying that um, a lot of religious groups don't really have a problem with this. And I, I, and I, w I wish I remember to bring some, some quotes some, from some religious leaders, including uh, one of, one of uh, John Paul, Paul of the Catholic Church, who said he doesn't see any, any, any contradiction between evolution and, and, and creation, mm. or science and, and, and creation. Having said that, I want to say that um, all of us are very curious about our ancestry. Pretty curious. Yeah. If I were to ask you about your ancestry, uh, or you as a person, mm. you give me, you tell me your, your dad's name, your grandfather, you may go into several generations. We are curious mm. to know about our ancestry. You give me a long genealogy <coughs> about your family, I mean, mm. about yourself. Mm. If I want to ask you about uh, the, the, the ancestry of your people um, and his people and her people, you give me a lot of needs that speak to that. For example, the Kikuyus, mm. uh, they've been told, or they believe that uh, their first mother was Mumbi and their first father was Kikuyu, Kikuyu mm. I believe. Mm. <coughs> the Kambas, uh, they, they, they hold their belief that uh, the Kambas began from a place in, in Mukambani, Zawi, or some other place. Mm. The Luas and other people, they, they have, a, they have, a, they have a, a story, an explanation as to how they came into being. We are very curious, all of us, to know where we came from. Very curious. And, and the question is, how far, how far can we go? Mm. If the Kikuyus, for example, came from Mumbi and, and Kikuyu, where did Mumbi and Kikuyu come from? There had to be some divine yeah, power. It, it goes into divinity. Exactly. It's God and then Kikuyu, Mumbi. Exactly. God and then the Mkambat and Zawi. Exactly. 
<laughs> there has to be some divine power yeah. somewhere that 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 created Mombi and Kikuyu. Science tells us that yeah. life began from a from a very single I mean a single cell. Life began from a single cell. Mm. But science doesn't tell us where the single cell came from. <laughs> Does it? <laughs> no, it, doesn't. it doesn't. That's the divine. Instead, mm. it talks about intelligent design. Yeah. yeah. That is the divine power. That's where God. And and to me, to me, where where science ends, that's where the divine power of God begins. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Because where science cannot I mean like, like explain, that's where God God or divine powers begin. So to me, I think it's, I think it's, it's easy, it's easy to marry the two. Uh, again, you've seen, you've seen like in the last maybe 20 years ago, or even more than that, 20 years ago. Uh, we've seen archaeologists in, in Israel, for example, trying to dig, I mean, digging deep into, we've had the discovery of the, of the tomb of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And nobody disputes that. Archaeologists are scientists. Nobody disputes that uh, the, the, the archaeologists in, in Israel discovered the tomb where Jesus may have been buried. Nobody disputes that. Even the Christians themselves. Mm. Nobody. You know, I'm laughing, Dr. Yeah. If you go to Israel as a tourist, uh, depending on the sort of tour, you you know, they, they tear their tours. Uh? Yes. Mm. If, I would like to visit. But yeah. Yes, I, 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 I have visited. <laughs> and... Uh, it, there is, let, let me call them category A, B, and C for purpose of our discussion, mm. where A is the really good category. Mm. Mm. You'll find that there are probably three such sightings. They'll tell you, this one is closest to the truth. Another one, this one is not so close. The other one, this one is in great dispute. Mm. What I'm saying is, you are absolutely right in that the moment you're talking about science, you have boundaries within which you can determine an issue. But then when now business, as in tourism, comes in, it, it can interfere with something that actually can be proved fairly scientifically. Because mm. I, there were three Golgothas that I actually... <laughs> you went to three Golgothas. Yeah, I mean, you're told the, 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 this is this, this is the other, and this is the other. Yeah. Yeah. And they explain to you how it is. But they're all within the same sort of like area. It's not as though one is far flung from one side to the other. So you had paid for first class tour. Yes, I had. So someone who's paid for like third class will just be taken to one Golgotha. You'll be taken to another. We'll be taken to the indisputed Golgotha. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You see, my point is, Dr. Ari is right. Science actually helps distill and remove some of these doubts. Because they'll explain to you why it is they have arrived at the conclusion they have arrived at. And there will be facts to support what it is that they're saying. Mm. Yes. Exactly. And if you think about it, my... Uh, 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 my brother, um, look at look at the Bible. The Bible tells us, uh, "Thou shall not kill, mm. thou shall not do this and that." And in 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 my view, uh, the Bible uh, provides a, a framework within which we should live as as, as humans. You know, you, if you do this, you be in the wrong. Mm. You know, if you if you kill your neighbor, it's wrong. So science really provides that framework, some boundaries that we can go, we, we can go beyond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, look, I, I'm looking at, this is clear that it is important. Just what CT is saying about three Golgothas, for example, and there are paleontologists, archaeologists who work in that area, taking samples here and there to then be able to build a story around this, right? And here we are talking about... Uh, a site in Kenya that's in situ that you don't have to go far you don't have to go anywhere else to see that this actually happened here so there's two questions how important or critical then in telling the stories of what happened in this area is now this particular site Kariandusi and then for children interestingly a five-year-old asked me the other day how do you know what Jesus looked like and I thought to myself well there are people who've been able to put not the normal picture you see of a man with flowing hair but the people who've actually put together different things that they have found over time to say look this is the picture of how he could have looked like as an example so how important then is the study of these things in the teaching of young people who are interested in finding out where they came from that's a very interesting question uh first of all i'd like to say that uh indeed uh karyan fits pretty well uh, 
as a key part of our heritage as a, as a country. Mm. And, and the site itself provides that unique information that, that really contributes in a big way to the understanding of our ancestry as a species. And like you rightly put, the site, the site is there. The tools are there. And you can see them. You can touch them. You can feel them. You can see where they occur. You can see even the structure within which they, they occur. The, those structure are datable. They've been dated. So indeed, it fits pretty well in enriching in, in uh, the rich prehistory of this country mm. in terms of our ancestry as a species. I know, and I said earlier on, that Kenya is truly, we can say, firmly based on the fossil record, based on the prehistoric record, Kenya is truly the cradle of mankind. Mm -hmm. We have a rich record that dates uh, from the last seven million years ago into the present. Kariandusi fits within the one million time slice. Mm -hmm. so, so that long history cannot be so much complete mm -hmm. without Kariandusi, because Kariandusi feeds into that rich history. So us really understanding and, and, and appreciating and really recognizing and celebrating Kariandusi, I believe we celebrate that, the, the, by extension, that mm. long record that this country has. Mm. Kariandusi just gives a little slice of that history. So Kariandusi goes back about a million, a million years, ago. years ago. Yes. But we have prehistoric sites that take us back seven million years ago yes. in Kenya. In Kenya, even which, beyond. Which is, the, which is the oldest? Which one takes us? There's, there are all, there's one particular site in, in, in Baringo, mm -hmm. uh, Tugen Hughes, uh, from where the famous Olorin Tugenesis was discovered. It is between six to seven million years ago. That's, the, that's one of the the earliest human ancestor mm -hmm. uh, from Baringo. Yeah, so so from, from that early time period, we have very, very rich record that goes all into the present. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the to that five-year-old kid uh, that, that asked, I mean, how can you tell who Jesus was and how he looked like? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not always easy mm -hmm. to tell uh, to even in our historic times, it's, we, it's not very easy to tell the color or the skin color of any one particular person because skin color is never preserved in, in, the, in the record, in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. But we are, able, we are able, based on the skeletal elements, mm -hmm. the, bo the, the body parts that we recover, we are able to tell that this person was this tall, this mm -hmm. person was this short because of the, the limb bones. Mm -hmm. Because we can, we can, we can reconstruct uh, the stature of that one particular individual based on the long bones. Like, for example, if the, if the, 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 the femur or the thigh bone was this long, yeah. we know this part of person must have been a tall, a tall person. Mm -hmm. If the, 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 the shin bone was, was short, we know that this was, must have been a, a short individual. Like, for example, we know Homo erectus were overall tall human beings. Mm -hmm. We know members of the genus Australopithecus, mm -hmm. uh, for example, Australopithecus of Pharaensis, that also remains have been discovered in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. We know they were they were shorter shorter people, based on the long bones, based on their skeletal elements. Mm -hmm. We know uh, the Neanderthals, for example, they were huge, massive people, based based on the the, the 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 bones that we recover in the fossil record. But we cannot tell the skin color of all these people mm -hmm. because skin color is never preserved in the in the fossil, in the fossil record. So so really, uh, uh, getting back to your question. I know there's been all kinds of speculations as to whether Jesus was African or whether it was, it was this and that. These are things that we cannot re really determine. Uh, uh, but I, I, I don't want to go into that because, you sure, know... Sure, but I think the general idea, the general idea is, that is that you can tell about where you have come from. Based on where... Based on... Based on like, for example, like, for example, if the, if the remains were... If the fossil remains... If the bones were recovered in Africa, mm. most likely you'd be probably an African. Mm. Mm -hmm. But let me get back to this. We know, based on the fossil record, based on the fossil record, the early, the first humans... Based on the first record, remember, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the now what, prehistoric. What is on record? Mm -hmm. Yeah, prehistorically. Mm -hmm. We know that human beings began as black. As black. We know... Why? The because they were in Africa? Because, because um, if you live close to the equator, you got to have a, a dark skin mm -hmm. for you to be able to... Survive. Survive. Mm -hmm. 
so the, the ultraviolet rays, they're going, to, they're going to harm your skin. You have to develop melanin, melanin that will protect your skin. Mm. We know the, the issue of skin color, it's a, it's a more recent phenomenon based on where, where, where I mean, when, when human, human beings moved, moved into, into the northern hemisphere, mm. you, you, I mean, where, where there's little sun, uh, we know that the first humans, and in fact, uh, a colleague from a friend of mine, Professor Nina Jemlonsky, uh, based in the US, she's done a lot of research on, on, on skin color. And she's been able to, to determine that, that uh, human beings, the very first human beings, were black. Were black, black. And we know, based on the first record, mm. that human beings moved from Africa. Mm. And the, the first ones were Homo erectus. They, they moved out of Africa around 1.8 millions ago to occupy other parts of the world. Mm. And if you li live in the equator, you got to have a, dark, a darker skin uh, that has more melanin that, that would protect your skin from, from damage. You know, I've got two questions, but let me ask the first one. The first one is uh, based on the work that you do at the National Museums of Kenya. As a director of antiquities, sites and monuments, you're the one who's there for basically just taking care of our sites, like Karindusi and the others that you've told us about, for example, the Tugan Hills and all but also the antiquities. Now, there has been all this debate about um, an African antiquities that have found themselves outside of Africa and the whole issue of repatriating them back to the country. Do we have any that belong to Kenya that are not in Kenya that you're trying to pursue? Well, that's a very interesting question, but also very thorny. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would like to begin by saying that indeed Kenya, like a lot of Afri African countries, there are a lot of uh, artifacts that are out there. And I was very, I was very happy the other day, in fact, I think uh, uh, late last week, to see, you may have read that uh, Benin, mm -hmm. yep. uh, they've opened an, um, an exhibition mm -hmm. that showcases some of their heritage yep. after, the, after those artifacts were returned from France. Mm. There's a big move across, across the African continent for the re repatriation of those artifacts that were either stolen, if you like, or looted. Or just stolen. Or just stolen. Mm -hmm. if you, I mean, I'm just trying to be a bit diplomatic. Got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there, there's a big push. And in fact, I would say that um, uh, in, 20, in 2019, I gave a talk in, at the University of Oxford mm -hmm. in the UK. Mm -hmm. And the title of my talk was Decolonization, Decolonization of African Museums. How can we decolonize museums in Africa? Mm -hmm. And the, the topic, the topic of objects, African objects being being out there, was a, an issue that we discussed pretty well. So there has been which is our most prominent artifact that's out there. There are many. There that, are many. That you uh, there, there say that Dr. Monty, like, like, you for, like, and, the, for example, and the government like, of Kenya are saying, if we got this one back. It signifies that we are actually going to get the others. There are many. There are many. There are a lot of forces uh, in in museums, especially in the UK. Mm. There are even there are even even the the the, the, the li Man lands of Savo. They are in Chicago. The mm. Field Museum in Chicago. There has been a push by the government to have those um, uh, Man lions of 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 Savo come back to this country. I know it's a process that has to be. Uh, and Diplomatic. diplomatically it's not an issue that I can I can address myself here and I know our, our, our CS and other senior government officers they're involved in this uh, so I'd like to, to report that there are efforts by the government uh, working closely with the, with, the, with, the, with the National Museums of Kenya who are the custodian of that heritage on behalf of the Kenyan people there are many efforts to have those those artifacts and collections mm. brought back to this country but but remember that those artifacts and collections have been there for a very long time mm. some of them they become collections of those museums mm. so so from a collections point of view when you document a collection in any particular museum there has to be there has to be procedures that have to be followed for you to the accession those collections at that as part of the collection of, of that particular museum. Mm. I'll give you an example. We have some fossil fossil crocodiles that to date are in the Hebrew Museum uh, of Hebrew University in Israel. Mm. Those collections were taken there many years ago. Uh, they're fossils. They were taken there for study. Mm. And they've been accessioned as part of the collection in that particular museum. So we, we've been pushing really for, for those fossils to come back to Kenya. Mm -hmm. But the question has been, the issue has been they're so fragile and there's the fear that the, the repatriation 
the packaging and all that, by the time they, they get back to this country, they'll be in pieces. Well, they got there without those, some great technology. How about them coming back and with even better technology today in terms of preservation? Exactly. I mean, I know that, 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 that's true. That's yeah. true. That's true. There's that, I mean, we, we can do it. But you see now the, the beauty of it, the good thing now, we can, we can micro CT scan those fossils mm. and we can re reproduce the same, the same fossils. But now they've become uh, part of the collection now in the Hebrew University in Israel. What I'm trying to say is that indeed there are a lot of uh, collections artifacts and addicts, if you like, mm. that are stored in foreign institutions, I mean, uh, out of this country, that need to come back to this country. But Dr. Ari, yes. did they take everything? I mean, when... <laughs> they uh, left something, uh, no? <laughs> no, I, I assume they took things which they thought were of importance. Mm. But what about the collections of things that remained? What are we doing with them? What have we done with them? Can uh, I jump onto that question just please. a little yeah. bit? Yes. Because here we are, mm. uh, we, we talk about, I mean, for example, I think about the mask of Festac, which was one bronze artic uh, artifact that was taken from West Africa. It is. It was on continuous exhibitions for years and governments made billions from people just coming to see. And here we are, and you're saying the beginnings of mankind are here in this country, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't it something that can be blown up, not just even uh, local tourism, foreign tourism, learning for children in, uh, from, from uh, primary school up until secondary? For me, I think that there is so much that can be done in terms of learning and history, in terms of tourism and recreation. With what is here, what can be done? Because here we have foreign governments making a lot of noise about things that are not even their own. And then here you are, you have the thing right here. What are we doing with it? I tell you, I tell you, you are really helping me a big way. This country has so much. And I'm so happy that you guys, you can host me this morning. Because we need all of us as Kenyans, we need to speak to that particular issue. What are we doing as a, as a nation, as mm. a country, to beat all the drums about this heritage? We have some of the most unique and rich and diverse collections but they're just there what's lacking is it budgetary support is it political goodwill uh, and a number of it's a number of things it's a number of things a bunch budget budget uh, support uh the media like you guys come in join, join hands now with us mm. and i think it's all of us different players the media the government the nmk the private sector all of us coming together to beat all the drums about about this, mm. and, and and I'll give you a, a good example, mm. the US, they are wonderful. I mean, they've dinosaurs, and they they make big time use of mm -hmm. those dinosaurs. Mm. They have dinosaur parks all over. I mean, like like in the U in the western part of the US, mm. uh, Wyoming, Montana, Utah, they have all kinds of dinosaur parks, and through those dinosaur dinosaur park, parks, they make so much money through tourism. Yep. Mm. Kenya has, we have Lake Turkana with all the wonderful fossil sites. We have all of the Saile, very close to, to Nairobi. Just you can, down here. Yeah, you can, you can almost walk down, down to all of the Saile, mm -hmm. very close to, to Nairobi. I wish there was, a, there was a tourist circuit that would take our, our, our tourists to the Nairobi National Museum, for example. Mm -hmm. We go to Karen Brixen, we go to Giraffe Center, we go to Nairobi National Park. Then probably go to Kalidus, I mean, go to Olugisele, mm. which is just next door. So I think as a, as a nation, as a country, we all need to come together. And I'm so happy that this morning we can host this program mm. because we need to, all of us, come together and really, really see how best we can tap on this heritage. That come this country come has. again soon, Dr. Ari. So we talk about all these sites and the importance of the sites and how to access them and the work that you've done as the National Museums of Kenya to say, uh, put together the artifacts, to put together the uh, exhibition so that if people come to a particular site, like Kari and Lucy, if we were to come this Friday, this is what we will be able to see. And it's, this is how easy and accessible it is. And we thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Dr. Frederick Mandi is the Senior Paleontologist and Director of Antiquities, Sites and Monuments at the National Museums of Kenya. Head on down to Kariandusi this weekend, this Friday, and then into the weekend. This Friday is Kariandusi Day. That's what National Museums of Kenya is, will be celebrating. It's just down here at Elementaita, heading towards Nakuru. Get to Elementaita. On your right, as you're heading towards Nakuru, you will see a big sign there, National Museums of Kenya, Kariandusi Prehistoric Site. 
Go in and see what uh, Dr. Manthi and the others have to show us.